You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Stephen Rowley. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. We've got a great show lined up for you today. Before we get started, I'd like to thank some sponsors for making the show possible. Patricia Gillum, World Gone Red, her new short story, Heroes of Corvus, book two, a sequel to A Superhero's Duty. Daniel Spires reveals to his team and Icarus that someone has been mass abducting the children of modern heroes and villains around the world. Icarus searches for answers while dealing with the physical aftermath of his encounter with Hellstorm. His powers are fading, and a compromised hero may cost him his life. This is an excellent new series from Patricia Gillum. There's going to be more coming soon. Stay tuned for it. Get in on the series while it's unfolding. Patricia Gillum, World Gone Red, Heroes of Corvus, Book 2. I'd also like to thank Richard Fox and his Ember War Saga. Guys, if you love science fiction the way I do, you must read the Ember War Saga. Nine books uh, with several spinoffs, uh, lots of great stuff going on in the Ember War. This one, and if you love audio, let me tell you, Luke Daniels narrates the audio for this series, and it is absolutely amazing. We're going to be talking about the Ember War Saga more in coming episodes, but uh, go check it out on Amazon. The Ember War Saga by Richard Fox. Now on to our great show. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm excited to have Stephen Rowley on the show with me today. He has a fantastic new book called The Editor that I think you guys are really going to love. Uh, welcome to the show, Stephen. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you. Um, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, goodness. I can think back all the way. And in fact, um, you know, writers always steal little autobiographical nuggets to insert uh, <laughs> into their work. Sure. But, you know, and there, there is a similar story in the editor, my new novel uh, coming out April 2nd. Um, but I remember that my mother had a an old, it was a sort of a Robin's egg blue typewriter, um, probably from the 1960s. And uh, she had it in the house. I'm not even sure why. Um, but I sort of coveted that typewriter as, um, you know, I was one of four kids, but that that I had my eye on that, that that sort of belonged to me. But there was something about typing very simple stories, and it would take me hours to, you know, type a paragraph, probably. <laughs> Um, but there was something about typing out a story that made me feel sort of published in a way um, that lended some authenticity uh, to it. And uh, I, I just remember uh, the joy in sort of seeing my words typed up like that. Um, and uh, I, I would get upset when the ribbon would get tangled or whatever. And she had the other kids to deal with and I, I, she wouldn't prioritize the uh, the uh, typewriter ribbon repair as, as quite as high on her list as I wanted her to. But th that's some of my earliest memories of, of writing. That's fantastic. You know, there, there's still something very visceral and, and magical about the typewriter. And uh, no matter how technology moves forward and, and uh, you know, I wouldn't trade my laptop for, for a typewriter for my daily writing. Uh, no. But, but there's something, I, I don't know. There, there's this romantic connection with it. The sounds that it makes too. I mean, the, the sort of bell and the carriage return, and you know, it's it's such. Uh, yeah, there's just nothing uh, quite as tactile as an old typewriter. Well, you know, as uh, uh, as a a kid in the '80s, when when I took uh, typing class, when we still had mm -hmm. such a thing in high school as typing class, mm -hmm. um, we had IBM Selectrix. Uh, I think the Model Two. And there was something about putting your, your hands, your fingers on the home row keys and feeling the vibration in there, uh, to this day. That is, uh, that's such a visceral memory. And it's just this, this feeling of, of possibility. And, uh, it, it's just so funny to me how we get 
connected to tools like that? Yeah, I think we were probably the last ones to squeak through in the 80s with typing classes on typewriters. Um, but I did this the same. And looking back, it's so funny. It's, you know, I took typing at, uh, on a whim, um, not knowing that it was probably the most important class I took in <laughs> school, uh, based on what I do today. Right. It's so funny. So funny. Um, so the the experience with the typewriter and 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 getting these stories out um was there ever um an adult in your life maybe maybe your mom uh who who fixed the typewriter for you uh, maybe a school teacher uh, anyone who recognized that you had this this storytelling gift or gene and gave you any encouragement yeah i you know there were a number of teachers uh that had a profound effect on my life. Um, and not all of them English teachers either. Um, but, um, yeah. And early on I was very involved in, in drama and acting too. And that was a way for, to, um, sort of be a vessel for other people's stories. Um, but I always loved, uh, stories and storytelling. Um, even if I wasn't the one doing the writing, um, but yeah, there were a number of people who had a, a sort of profound effect on, on my life. At what point, uh, Stephen, did you realize that this was something that you wanted to pursue uh, career-wise? Um, that, that's an interesting question. It was a, it was a sort of strange evolution. Um, I I went to I studied film in college. Uh, I moved to Los Angeles after college, thinking I would pursue a career in film production, um, and that sort of soon led to to writing. I was um, attempting to make a, a go of it as a screenwriter for years here before turning to novel writing, um, and that has its its ups and downs. I enjoy the sort of collaborative nature of writing for film, but um, you know, th- there's uh, it's also sometimes a case of of writers' voices aren't the ones who rise to the top, which is why I think we see a lot of um, mediocre films. To be quite frank, you know, um, the the screenwriter is not is not always very high on the totem pole. Um, so, uh, you know, I sort of accidentally fell into into novel writing, um, but I remember the first time I sat down with my my editor for my first book. Um, and she, she gave me some notes and, and, and said something like, but I defer to your vision as the uh, creative authority. And I almost fell out of my chair because in, in 15 years of trying to make a go of it as a screenwriter, I'd never heard anyone defer to my authority. <laughs> well, it, it, it's so weird. We, we think of films, we think of, um, of, of a director, a, a strong director, yeah. and, and you say, "Oh, well, that's a Spielberg film. I'm, I'm definitely mm-hmm. going to see that." O- mm-hmm. Or we think of a strong, um, uh, you know, acting presence from from yeah. an actress or an actor, and and they, it, it's it's like we focus more on those, uh, the, the director or the actor's interpretation of the writing as our experience and. And they're, they're interpreting what, what one of us has written. And, uh, I, I think it's a tragedy that, that the focus has shifted the way it has. Yeah. I, you know, you can name, um, a handful of screenwriters maybe that, um, have broken through that, like Ch- uh, Charlie Kaufman or, a, a William Goldman or something where you, where you sort of know the writer a little bit if you're a true cinephile, but that's the exception, not the rule. Right. Um, you're, at what point did you uh, shift to writing fiction, and what was the the catalyst to to move from from screenwriting to uh, to prose? Yeah, um, when I uh, wrote my first novel, Lily and the Octopus, um, it was something I sat down to write. Um, I chose to write it. Uh, as a novel because it was a deeply personal story to me. It was um, very autobiographical. Um, And I just couldn't – there were things that I wanted to do with the story that, one, I couldn't imagine doing on film. And, two, because it was so personal to me, I didn't want all these other voices uh, chiming in. It was very uh, personal and and private to me. So once I decided – to write it as a novel, I sort of gave myself the challenge of breaking every screenwriting rule I could think of. So, you know, when, when you write for film, it's very, um, 
uh, you, you know, you, you, you have to show a lot through action or dialogue. It's very external. Um, but when I wrote Lily and the Octopus, it's very sort of an internal story. A lot of it takes place inside, uh, the main character's, uh, imagination. Um, there's a dog that he hears talk to him. One of the main characters is an octopus. So, you know, I, I, everything I could think of, a, a, um, a, um, producer would say, nope, can't do that. Um, not paying for that. Uh, that's not even possible. Um, <laughs> put it all in the book, uh, and had quite a good time doing it. Um, so, uh, it was, a you know, I, I leaned into what novels could do. And I think, uh, I had a lot of fun with that. That's one of the great things about novel writing is there are no budgetary constraints. Uh, we can make, explosions as big as we want we can write fantastical creatures we can uh write uh reality that that reads like dream sequences and 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 there's uh, you know our imaginations are the only limit yeah yeah um what was the what was the initial um idea for uh for lily and the octopus where did that story come from well, I so Lily was a dog, and I uh, that I had um, from puppyhood into into old age, and she was a sort of constant companion to me. You know, writing can be a very solitary occupation, and I didn't realize how much I had come to lean on this dog um, and her presence in my life. Um, she passed away in 2013 of a brain tumor. I'm sorry. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, this is, you know, I thought I was, uh, prepared, uh, intellectually anyway, we know dogs don't, uh, or animals don't live as long as we do. Um, certainly as long as we wish they would. Um, uh, but I was, uh, really sidelined by grief and not really sort of understanding why this loss had such an impact on me. Um, and so I did what writers do, which is sort of sit down to write about, uh, the experience to try to understand it. Um, I soon realized what I was writing about was attachment and, and how difficult it can be to let go. Um, and in that sense, an octopus sort of entered the story because, <laughs> uh, I, you know, there was something about having a tentacular sort of metaphor that, that made sense to me, something that uh, could have a literal stranglehold on you. Um, I never really thought that there was a octopus stuck to my dog. Um, I was pretty clear <laughs> what was happening uh, to her in real life, but but the story sort of went from there. And then and then once I realized I, I there was an octopus, I thought, well, I need to write the book in eight parts. And there's all this sort of imagery and symbolism and and whatnot. And I really um, had a good time with it. Um, however. Uh, you know, and it was a very healing, uh, uh, experience. However, if you want to hear crickets on the other end of a phone, try calling literary agents and say, do you have any interest in my book about a dog with an octopus stuck to her head? Uh, cause you don't get very far, certainly. And, uh, you know, it, over a year I couldn't, couldn't get anywhere with this book. And so I thought I might self publish it, um, and, you know, self-publishing can be a wonderful um, road for, for writers now, but it does it does sort of run the gamut. There's all sorts of stuff out there, and I knew that I wanted to prefer, uh, appear as professional as possible. So it was suggested to me that I hire an independent uh, sort of freelance editor, which I did to sort of polish the book. Um, and she was able to uh, get it in through a connection that she had to an editor at Simon & Schuster. And I still didn't think much would come from that uh, because I had received so many rejections for the book. Um, but sure enough, they uh, they uh, really took a shine to the book and said, you know, we'd like to make an offer. You need to get an agent. And, you know, for any aspiring writers out there, I can tell you, if you have an offer for publication, it's much easier to get an agent. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In fact, you can kind of choose. Um, so that was a... Um, you know, a really sort of magical experience, you know, and I've been around the block long enough to know that that's not really how it works. So, um, you know, I'm not one to, to really believe that, you know, there was a little dog up there pulling the strings, but, um, but, you know, it's hard not to think there was a, a little bit of magic around this. Right. Well, one thing is really interesting about, uh, writing as processing grief. Um, I, I think some of the best writing I've ever done is, is when I was working through, uh, things like that, maybe with, with one of my kids or, 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 or something. And, and there's, uh, what's, what's unique, um, or, or unexpected. I, I think people 
expect that if you're writing um, out of grief or you're, you're processing these emotions and these feelings, that everything is going to be morbid and, uh, and, and it's going to look like someone is processing grief. Um, a lot of times what comes out um, can oftentimes be funny, can be um, warm and uh, can be quirky and and the, the, the grief in that is, is worked into that somehow. Um, but the, the end product can be something very different than what is expected. Um, at the end of that project, how did you feel, um, about what you had created? And, uh, and, and do you feel like that it was, it, it became kind of more than the sum of its parts? Yeah, it really did. Uh, when I finished it, I was proud of it as a piece of writing, but you know, the voices that are, inside of our head as artists that devalue our own work are are loud and they are persistent so um even though i thought this is a good um piece of writing um i didn't think that it would have anything to offer um anyone who um did not know me or did not know this dog um and so, you know, I, I instantly thought, you know, um, who cares? Uh, and what the real surprise of this journey has been has, uh, is that uh, how much it has touched other people and how sort of universal um, processing grief or, or the desire to understand grief has been. Now, this book went on to be translated in 19 languages and uh, it was a bestseller. And, and now, even though I broke every screenwriting rule, uh, Amazon Studios has picked it up for a film adaptation. So working on that. So it, it's been so rewarding to see other people respond to something that I thought was maybe individual to me. Right. Uh, and and what a fantastic story um, that that the, not only the book, but the story around the book, um, it, it has to make you very proud that this relationship, uh, you know, uh, begat all of these wonderful things. Yeah, it really is a, a gift that she has, uh, you know, that that dog uh, had given me. And it's, uh, um, you know, wonderful to, to think about all the new friends that she's making through, you know, <laughs> readers across the world. Right. You know, she was a doctor. So for a girl with ridiculously, I mean, comically short legs, she's really traveled around the world. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Uh, let's talk about the new book, The Editor. So mm -hmm. coming coming from a book like that uh, to, uh, you know, and, and one of we talk about this a lot is one of the great gifts uh, for a writer. A lot of times is is the anonymity of the first book. Uh, no one knows you're writing it. No one's expecting anything. Mm -hmm. No one, uh, you know, you, you're just it's it's a solitary life, but it, but it's your life and and no one's expecting anything. Well, th then that first book happens and you find, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of su success with that, like you did. Um and then you you follow that up. Um, where where does the editor come into your life? Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting follow up uh, because there, there's no dog uh, this time, <laughs> and everybody wanted to know. You know, sort of the elevator pitch for the editor is a, a young writer in early 1990s New York City, uh, armed with a, a candidly autobiographical manuscript that he wrote. Uh, finds out a publisher is interested in it, and the editor. Uh, who who is interested uh, turns out to be Jacqueline Onassis, who did indeed work as an editor um, first at Viking Press and then at Doubleday for for fifteen years after uh, her divorce from from Aristotle Onassis. So um, you know that's that's quite a leap from from what the first book was uh, on the, its surface. However, it made sense to me, and what I thought um, about. In, in choosing a subject for a next book was, you know, I sat down when I wrote Lily and the Octopus to write to try to understand. Um, and I wanted to I wanted to sort of be armed with that mission again. Now, um, I wrote a an autographical autobiographical novel um, in Lily, and it exploded in a, in a way that was much bigger than I ever imagined. So I wrote some deeply personal things about myself, about other people. Um, but even though I changed the names, uh, some identities are hard to 
mask. You know, um, mom comes to mind, for instance, you know, it, somehow eagle eye readers uh, crack that code. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I thought about a character, you know, with a similar situation who writes something very honest about um, his family and the people in his life and, and what would be a way that it might explode into a much bigger way that he intends. Um, well, if Jacqueline Onassis got her hands on him, um, you know, and what if that family were Irish Catholic and they grew up sort of revering the Kennedys and, and, um, now he's written about sort of, of his own mother's flaws and they're in the hands of someone who we viewed sort of as America's mother or the, the idealized, um, you know, image of motherhood. Uh, so he's sort of trapped between these two strong women in his life. And, um, and from there I was off to the races. What a, what a fantastic, um, meta story. Um, if you will, the, the first book that you wrote is, is so much about you. And then you write a book about a man writing a book that is so much about him. Um, did you, did you ever kind of sit back and, and kind of chuckle at, uh, at just kind of the, the glorious absurdity of it all? Uh, I certainly had fun with it. Um, yeah, there, there were, there were sort of moments where, um, uh, you know, I, I tried to, to think back at some of the, the oddities that happened with, with, uh, with Lily, um, and tried to make them entertaining. You know, it's, it's interesting because, uh, you, you know, in writing about, about grief and the dog, you know, the octopus entered the picture. Um, and that really, that's what really sort of turned it into a novel. And, and similarly with the editor, you know, the process of what happened to me, it was not enough to make a great novel. I needed to find, and pardon me with all due respect to Mrs. Onassis, you know, I needed to find my, my octopus for, for this new book. Um, and that's where she came in and sort of needed that sort of extra, element of of magic and so so yeah there was all these sort of meta moments that uh, made it very rewarding as a as a project i love the idea of jackie o as as the octopus without having to go all um uh you know cthulhu on it or anything yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> I, i'm sure i'm the only person to ever used uh, her name and the word octopus in the same sentence uh, of course, but, but we all understand and we get it now. Um, the, she was such a, a larger than life dynamic character. And, uh, I, I think for people of, of yours and, and, and my generation, um, we, our, our recollections of her are as Mrs. Onassis and mm-hmm. her, her later career. Um, for, for my parents' generation, she would be, uh, Jackie Kennedy. Mrs. Of course, Kennedy, yeah. Yeah, Mrs. Kennedy, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And uh, the first lady. And, uh, so, so we all have these very, um, particular memories of her and ideas of her. Um, when you start, for lack of a better word, humanizing her, um, or personalizing her maybe is a, is a better word. Um, really getting to her as a, as an everyday person instead of this, uh, this grand figure. Um, is, is that a daunting task when you're taking on, um, a, a real life character that, that we all have, um, ideas about? Oh, hugely daunting. Um, you know, everyone is going to have an opinion of who she was or what she sounded like. Um, the, the wiggle room that I had, uh, you know, so much that I had some was that she was so private in this sort of third act in her life. Um, I think in her entire 15 year career, she granted one interview. Um, and other than that, she stayed out of the press for, um, you know, uh, for her career. Uh, so not a lot of people know about what she was like as a colleague, a coworker, um, an editor, uh, or what it was like to work with her in this, in this fashion. So, um, there are a couple wonderful, uh, biographies on her, um, career and certainly on her life that mention mention her career. Um, so yeah, I did all the research I could, I even read some of the books that she was working on at this time in her career where where, when the novel opens in in 1992 um, so that I could see what were some of the subjects in her head, what were some of her interests right at that very moment and what what um, might have been occupying her mind 
um, so that I could try to create this character. And then you do the best you can um, through all the research and 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 everything. Um, and my editor, my publisher, Putnam, was very supportive um, in that they helped me track down some people who worked with her um, that would share their memories um, of working together. And then, you know, a little bit of is, is just sort of writerly uh, creativity. You know, there's a little bit of my imagination in there. Um, the book is sort of a, a wish fulfillment. I mean, how many of us wish we could sit down and had this kind of friendship with her? Um, so, you know, there's a little bit of fun as well. Yeah. And, and it's, and it definitely comes out uh, in the book. This is a um, th- this is a fun read, uh, and and like you said, a wish fulfillment uh, for uh, this is something that will um, appeal to to a wide audience. But there's something special for writers, I think, that they'll get from this book. Um, uh, the, you know, the the wish fulfillment aspect and the the kind of insider and getting to be friends with the 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 biggest insider uh kind of thing that's uh, uh that had to be a lot of fun to write oh it was it was enormous fun uh to write um not only in in, in creating um a version of mrs onassis and i think you know her legacy truly endures and there was something right now um you know given our current climate you know whatever your beliefs are um, there was a, a real class and, and gentility to her that I think, you know, all of us can can miss and do miss. Um, and so that was uh, rewarding to write. It was also a very interesting time in publishing, you know, sort of the early to mid 90s when this book takes place and that, you know, the, the sort of ebooks were coming down the pipeline. I think people saw this technology. There was a lot of nervousness in publishing about whether the printed book would endure or what it would look like um, or um, how things would change. And so it was an interesting time to just write about publishing in general. Right. Um, You talked about when you wrote Lily that you tried to break all of the screenwriting rules uh, and and it became very introspective. And the editor is is from a first person perspective, which Mm -hmm. uh, not many screenplays are. Um, Mm -hmm. We we normally have this um, either an omniscient narrator or or we have a very close uh, narrator, but Mm -hmm. but we're separated. Um, The I find after having talked about that, I find two interesting things about this book. One, um, it, it does appear that you followed in, in a, in a similar, uh, path with this book in the, the, it, it is very introspective. Um, mm-hmm. but the dialogue is fantastic in this. Um, does, does writing dialogue well come from, uh, your years of, of screenplay writing? Uh, screenplays are, almost all dialogue and, and a little instruction, but uh, does, does writing screenplays help to hone that skill? Yeah, oh, uh, absolutely. And, and I just personally, I, it's my favorite thing to write. I love, I love writing dialogue. I love putting words in characters mouths. Um, it's just a lot of fun to me. And it's amazing how many people, particularly in screenwriting struggle with, uh, with dialogue sometimes it's like a, a, i guess you know so certain writers just have an ear for it and certain certain others struggle with it but um it's something i've always enjoyed and i don't know you know like i, I did it's hard for me to understand writers who don't who who struggle with it because i i think you know as writers we're always listening um you know listening to other people talk and and from that should come the ability to hopefully to to write good dialogue um, the, the book, the editor is out everywhere now when people are hearing this. Um, I, I, I can't say enough good things about this book. It is so much fun. It's such a great read. Um, Stephen, if people are just learning about you and want to find out more about the work that you do and, uh, and all of that, is there a place where they can connect with you online? Uh, yeah, I'm all over social media at Mr. Stephen Rowley. Um, and I, uh, you can find me at my website, stephenrowley.com. Excellent. Stephen, we're going to send everybody to uh, pick up their copy of The Editor. Uh, it's been so much fun talking with you. We wish you much success on the book. And, uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll send everybody to see you. Thank you so much. It's always fun to talk about the craft, and I appreciate your insightful questions. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. 
For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Hello, young one. What ghoulish tale of horror shall we explore tonight? Shall we watch The Creep Show? The Nightmare on Elm Street? Child of the Night, give me your answer. Which one would Mom kill us for watching? said Buddy. Dad grinned and his eyes grew wide. Which do you think, Child of the Jackal? The Omen! And we might have time for Omen, too, if we hurry. She'll be home by eleven. I'll be back. Buddy ran to his room. He stripped down to his Yoda underwear and fished in the closet. Two minutes later, he snuck back into the living room wearing his skeleton costume from last Halloween. He crept up behind his dad, who was cueing the movie. But David Rittermeyer was too clever for that. He spun around at the last moment and bared fang teeth torn from paper plates, drawing a yip of surprise and a cry of, No fair! Daddy kicked off his Reeboks, plopped his smelly gym socks on the coffee table, another thing that Mom would hate, and killed the lights. The scary intro music began. The screen showed the silhouette of a boy, about Buddy's age. His shadow was a long, creepy cross. The Antichrist, the son of the devil born of a jackal on a night of astrological portent, destined to bring about the end times and the final battle of good versus evil. Buddy sipped sun-kissed and scooted up next to his dad. As the movie got scarier, he slipped an arm through his father's and cupped his big bicep. Buddy could feel his father's pulse. Dads get scared, too. They flinched together, shouted together, pointed at the screen and covered their faces together. Buddy pressed his eyes to Daddy's shoulder just before the on-screen maid shouted, It's all for you, Damien! and dove from the roof, hanging herself. Buddy knew which parts he was old enough to watch and which parts he wasn't. He trusted his dad to let him know when to look again. Occasionally, his dad tricked him into peeking too soon, but that was part of the fun. They kicked their feet at the screen and shouted, Look up! Look up! Oh, idiot! Don't get yourself killed! At the climax, the hero of the movie, Mr. Thorne, discovered a birthmark of three sixes on his son's head and dragged the little antichrist to the altar of the church, determined to spear his son with holy daggers and end evil forever. After it was over, the Rittermeyer men sat silently through the credits. David put an arm around his son and ran his fingers through Buddy's hair. He wasn't searching for devil marks. He knew there weren't any and Buddy was certain there were no daggers in his father's hand, either. Those things were just make-believe. Real fathers and sons don't do bad things to each other. They were queuing up Omen 2 when the power went out. No, Buddy whined. Not on movie night. Daddy went to the window. It's the whole block. Sorry, Damien. How about, hmm, scary blackout? Go get the Ouija board out of the guest room closet. Cool. And candles. Buddy found the Ouija board, hidden under old clothes. When he shut the sliding door again, the sight of a monster startled him, and he let out an involuntary, huh, sound. It was his own skeleton-bodied reflection in the mirrored closet door. He stared at it. He liked the effect of moonlight on his cheeks. Spectral. Haunted. His eyes big and white. He clacked his teeth at himself, picturing his own grinning skull under his child's flesh, and gave an evil laugh. He was answered by a scream. A woman's scream. High-pitched and far away. One of the neighbors? Buddy dropped the Ouija board into a patch of moonlight and sat with it. What's going on? He whispered, his fingers on the heart-shaped wood planchette. 